Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about all things Arnold Jacobs all of the time. I'm here with uh, Oystein Bodzwick. Here we're here in Eugene at the University of Oregon School of Music. Puddles has joined us once again. Hey, Puddles. He says hi. Very silent guy. Strong but silent. Uh, anyway, I, I don't think that Oystein Bodzwick needs much introduction from me, other than to say thank you so much for being here at the uh, University of Oregon. Uh, uh, we've really enjoyed have you thank you on our campus and it's been some wonderful uh, master classes and can't wait for the recital this evening looking forward to it thanks for having me yeah one of the things uh, uh, in Oystein's background is uh, he had some lessons with Arnold Jacobs and I'm wondering if you can tell me what period of time was that what uh, when was that that was in 1994 when I was studying for Harvey Phillips privately at uh, Indiana University and this was in February, around the time where the Winter Olympics were in Norway. That's why I remember exactly the time. And uh, at that time, I had a feeling that uh, Jake wasn't teaching students. He was mostly into helping professionals that had, at some point in their life, had trouble with their jobs or breathing or whatever that prevented them from doing their job properly. So he didn't focus too much on the students. So I was lucky to get uh, um, a couple of lessons due to Harvey Phillips, who called Jake and, mm -hmm. and set that up. So you didn't have to go through the usual waiting process of calling repeatedly? No, I didn't do any phone calls. I just, uh, Harvey Phillips set it up and I got a time, go there, and I rented a car at Ugly Duckling Rental Services. I remember Ugly Duckling. Yeah. Yep, and um, I also remember the trip up there because uh, the, it was very very bad weather stor winter storms and uh, the ugly duckling car didn't come with windshield wipers <laughs> <laughs> so i was actually literally looking out the window of the car to see where i was going on the way up to chicago and that was tough with a six lane highway that reminds me of a scene from the blues brothers movie which was filmed in chicago where the uh, the oil starts leaking from the engine and they had to and I think Jake, Jake or I think Elwood had to look out the uh, exactly out the window, out the side window yep. there. Well, d what uh, uh, take us to that to that uh, you had? A, I think you said you had a couple of lessons during that during yeah. that period of time that week. Yeah. yeah. What was that? What do you remember from those um, lessons? It was um, as many others can uh, testify. Uh, it's uh, it's not life changing experience. So at least uh, tuba playing changing experience. And for me, it was all about uh, getting up there to his office, and I've heard a lot about the place, you know, it's like a, the office of a crazy scientist. Mm -hmm. You had these models of torsos with uh, all those plastic parts, like you can take the heart out and see what actually happens. This guy was very, very much into finding out what, what actually happens. But he would keep a lot of that information away from you, of course, because mm -hmm. he wanted you to think as little as, po little as possible about those scientific things and then focus on what he meant was the thing you, that could really help you develop. And for me it was very much about being too uptight in my playing. I was using a lot of force, a lot of energy. I was uh, young and I had a lot of energy and I, I aimed at using all of that rather than playing it the smart way. Mm -hmm. I get back to how you could do that. Well, I, I mean, you were at that point. You were you were fairly accomplished as a young young player. You'd won by that time. You'd won uh, uh, some. I, I yeah. I'd won uh, international competitions. Yeah. I have done my first solo CD, yeah. and you would think that um, uh, I was really on the right track. And to a certain degree, I was on the right track. But uh, there was a major thing that was lacking, like you could say, in the playing. And to put it real simple, it was moving the focus from this area mm -hmm. of my body to this area of my body it was moving the whole thing down so when i was playing for him i remember first i played the encounters mm -hmm. not sure why i picked that piece but he didn't like me to play that piece because it was sort of a difficult piece to analyze uh, what i was doing on so he picked up some bel canto i think it was and we did that instead and then it became very apparent that a lot of the things I was doing was due to the fact that I wasn't breathing in enough air. I was pushing out there. All my focus was on blowing out, mm -hmm. not inhaling properly. And he taught me about this 
residual air and the dangers that can occur if you are moving around too much in this residual air area when you are not dropping there out but you're right. pushing, pushing it out and all those reflexes that kick in at that point where you for example um, <clears throat> the body wants to survive so when it feels that you're on the reserves it starts saving air mm -hmm. by for example pressing the lips together by pressing the lips against the mouthpiece too hard by using this before you start to the valve salva yeah yeah exactly and I had been doing that in the past I've been doing this thing like this but that was over by the time I got there and I, but that was really as so bad that I had a hard time drinking coke for a long time because my throat was so sore from this thing that I, I couldn't drink coca-cola <laughs> wow and then I noticed what I was doing and I noticed this myself nobody heard this on my then present teachers so I had to sort of find out of that myself and I did and I managed to get rid of that now what I didn't notice what was the pressure that I was using and the Im immense pressure the lips pressing them together it sounded okay but I was using far too much energy mm -hmm. and again as a result of this uh, breathing that wasn't full enough I was the body was sort of uh, using those uh, ways to preserve air so you literally taught me some ways to get this part of the body the breathing apparatus more in into place so just uh, staying away from that as much as you can out of that last 30 35 percent and being more in the the upper 60 yeah. percent of your capacity so you could it, it's to, to put it simply during those two lessons we did two different things it was uh, um, it was uh, inhaling working on the inhalation exercises for inhaling properly and he meant that that inhalation would really um, take away those problems without me having to think so much about them again uh, his way of thinking was you don't have to focus on opening the lips you just breathe in fully and the lips will open by themselves mm -hmm. so again it's a very very clever thinking helped me a lot and the second thing there was uh, really um, about using the abs while playing and that might seem a little strange for some people because he would always say or at least the quotes i hear from others is relax never use the abs just you know uh, be as relaxed as possible all the time but to me he said the opposite uh, and he actually made me play on the mouthpiece i'm going to play that for you if i find the mouthpiece here i was working with the um, with the the bel canto and he told me to go ahead and play and then he said louder all right and so on mm -hmm. and afterwards i played the bel canto and what happened was that the lips were really free because they are just vibrating very freely when you play those staccatos plus the energy has been moved down here and it sounded a lot better yeah, I mean, it sounds like what he was doing was just getting you to uh, use more more air just to have it have it fall out of you. Yeah, but it wouldn't have worked if he just told me to go because right. that would really tension up my lips. So that's why he wanted me to go for those short notes instead of the long notes. He had to get you out of out of what you had been doing and into something new. Yeah. Uh, uh, in order to, to have that breakthrough with absolutely you. and I think it's really dangerous if you are trying to apply something that he said to one person onto somebody else without really analyzing if that was appliable yeah I think that's one of the reasons why he he never actually wrote a book could um, be just be, because he, he knew that that would be the case and and he didn't he actually uh, discouraged um, taping your first lesson because of uh, uh, he, there was a must, as much a lesson for him as it was for you, and he was trying to uh, uh, gather information about you, and so the information he was going to give you was for you and not for somebody else. Exactly.
much. Exactly. And you're not, he's not, he's not uh, focusing on the, uh, on the, on the, he's going end around. Right. Yeah. Without, without attacking the, getting you to think about that right, right, issue. Right. Yep. And, and that's, the, that's good pedagogy. When you can give someone an exercise, do it like this and it'll work without you having to analyze yourself all the time. Of course, there's a certain amount of analyze, analyze, yeah, analyzing going on, but right. you got to try to avoid it too much. And some people can't stop analyzing. Some just love going into those questions. Right. And people are very different. Some are like, I want to know what happened. I want to know down to the millimeter how I hold my lips, how my tongue is working. Yep. It's really not possible to keep them away from that thought. So you got to give them a little bit of information, mm -hmm. try to, so this works great, and then maybe put the focus on something else. Yeah, it seems like uh, for with Jacobs, he would, uh, he would try and meet the student where, where the student was. And if he, if he believed that the student uh, needed that information in order for Jacobs to be able to work with him, yeah. then he would give it to him. There's a great story about this. You probably heard it, but it's, it's about the, uh, a guy who was uh, lecturing in um, uh, nervosity. How do you deal with being nervous or overcome that? Mm -hmm. So it, he's, he was lecturing in front of an audience, a lot of people, over a thousand people. And he said, I need a volunteer. And of course, all those guys in the audience were there because they're nervous and they couldn't really get themselves to say, I want to be the volunteer. So he said, you be the volunteer and came up on the stage and she was very nervous, of course. And uh, he said to her, OK, you go over to the other side of the stage. I'll be here. About a hundred feet stage. And he took a tennis ball and he said to the girl, I'm going to throw this ball to you. And whatever you do, don't drop the ball on the floor putting a lot of pressure on her mm -hmm. and uh, she knew how to catch a ball but at that point she was terrified dropping it and uh, everyone was watching very anxiously and he threw the ball boom and it, she fumbled and missed it of course of course everyone went like oh you know <laughs> dealing with her now okay as expected of course and she threw the ball back and now he said give me the ball and I'll make a an X on the ball with a pen, with a sharpie, big black X. Show it to everyone, show it to her, and she's, he said, this time I'm going to throw the ball to you. You don't have to catch the ball. You just have to count how many times it spins, it's mo how many times you can see the X uh, turn around. And then give me the number afterwards. And she said, well, that's supposed to be, that's probably easy. He threw the ball, she went, one, two, three, four. Four times, right? Catching the ball at the exact same time as she was counting without even thinking of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone in the audience got the point. Mm -hmm. He was deflecting her attention from catching the ball and putting it on to counting instead, which made her intuitive catching reflex take over and she caught the ball no problems. Mm -hmm. And I find that that is really the case in music a lot of the time. So what I do to achieve this in music a lot of times, for example, in this master class, we have this guy playing in Bach. And he had a lot of small, you know, could be breathing, technical issues, a lot of things. Now, instead of focusing on them, those things, today I focused on having him playing a happy character in the music, doing pretty much the same thing as this guy with the tennis ball, mm -hmm deflecting his attention from how to play the tuba and on to how to play music. Right. And he was so caught up in this playing happy on the tuba that he forgot about how hard it is to play the tuba and all of a sudden it, it, sudden it sounded much better mm -hmm. already. And I think that happens to me a lot. So I try to fool myself in the same way when I'm on the stage, so to speak, by thinking very hard about the characters I'm after and uh, getting into character before I walk on stage or when I'm on the stage I make this little room around myself and I think you know about this character for the next piece and then usually the playing just comes by itself yeah the uh, uh, those two lessons that you had was that basically what you worked on with the, uh, the, the yeah. just getting getting more free yeah it was those two things the inhalation mm -hmm. fully inhalation we worked a little bit on the, on the poster and also 
um, getting the lips to vibrate freer by focusing more on the uh, abdominal area. Yeah, I love that example with the tennis ball because it's it's so true in terms of, of deflecting and and uh, just getting getting the student to be thinking over here when you're really working on this issue over here, right. over there. Right. Right. It's so effective. And you can you can trick students with this, but you can also trick yourself if you know that this is uh, working. Right. To a certain degree, though, I have to say that it's tough to say, to say to someone who is really unsecure about their own playing, you go ahead and just think about something else and it'll be all right. It, in theory, it sounds good. In practice, not so easy. So what you need is practicing, and I mean, uh, concert experience. Mm -hmm. Myself, I was, uh, 15 years ago, I did more than 1,000 concerts in a period of three years. Wow. Sometimes more than three concerts a day for kids, mm -hmm. uh, school kids. So in Norway we have this system where you can travel around, we play professional concerts at school. And um, you can imagine how it is. You get up there, at 9 o'clock in the morning, you have an audience of 500 people, kids, that know for a fact that tuba is the dullest instrument on the planet. Mm -hmm. And you're going to play for them for 50 minutes. And that's your challenge. So the focus is not on how to play the tuba, and you learn that pretty quickly. After your concert number 200, <laughs> you really just pick up the horn and start communicating, start entertaining, start bringing stuff over. Yeah. And you will notice that whatever you do to make that happen, happens automatically. And I remember, now that I'm talking about this, that Arnold Jacobs told me about this too. He had this period in his life when he played a lot of concerts, he would play on, on, on clubs, on, mm -hmm. like a freelancer, everywhere, uh, several times a night. And uh, to him, that led him into this position where he could let go of thinking on the technique and it just worked. Yeah. And I think the, the thing that got me there was, first of all, his uh, hint there, and then secondly, uh, these 1,000 concerts. It's quite a few. Quite a few. <laughs> oh, I see you mentioned that you were at IU uh, studying with Harvey. What was that? What was that like? Studying for Harvey is uh, or was very important to me as well. Equally important as studying for Jake, I would say, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Harvey was very uh, aware of the business part of music playing. So he was he was talking to me about how does the music meet the audience. How can you do in order to promote what you're doing and uh, and reach out? So that was part of it. Secondly, it was very about very much about the attitude you have when playing. I was, for example, I was practicing at that time. I remember that and he would say that I like the attitude you have when playing this. It's so worryless. And uh, that gave me confidence to continue working on that uh, worryless playing style where you think more about the character again mm -hmm. than whatever you do to make it happen. And he would be a great inspiration when it comes to finding repertoire. And uh, we worked on the Vaughan Williams concerto pretty thoroughly, very nicely. And then he would work on the sound quality. So give me some some great examples of sound quality. Well, that's wonderful. And then uh, you've also had experience studying with uh, John Fletcher. Absolutely. So John Fletcher, I just had two lessons for him at a conference in Norway in 1985. And oh. uh, by that time, I've heard him play um, uh, on recordings. Mm -hmm. Great, great inspiration. And my teacher at that time uh, worked in the Trondheim Symphony Orchestra. He had Harvey, no, uh, John Fletcher as his mentor and ideal. So he was teaching a lot about this, a lot in the same way as, as John Fletcher would do. What I remember about John was uh, that he was very much about clarity. As a soloist, you need to, to play as clear as possible so that the audience can hear what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And clear very often means smaller. And he was very much about, uh, in, even in an orchestra, every, as things become bigger, mm -hmm. you need bigger gear, bigger trombones, bigger strings. I mean, 
everything is expanding and become bigger and bigger and is that necessarily better mm -hmm. that was he was questioning all the time and one example he took was if you love someone and you want to tell them that you love them does it make more sense to scream that into that person's ear mm -hmm. rather than whispering it that was his very very good example there mm -hmm. Oystein, uh, some of the times that we've had together um, during your visit here to Eugene, um, I've been impressed just by talking about your lesson experiences. And it seems like you're able to really get a great deal of information out of one, just one lesson. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got to, you've got to use that experience and, and chew on it when you get home. Again, it's about uh, making it your own, and that takes some time. Some people need this follow-up by, week by week, but for me, it, it, it really was... I was a little slower, I guess, in absorbing the things. I needed to work in my own brain about it, with it. And what I'd like to say to the guys that watch this and wonder if they should go and spend money on a lesson or private study for someone, it's probably worth it. The Jake lesson, I was spending a lot of money on that probably close to $1,200 just for one lesson when it comes to uh, rental car, gas, hotel, food, the lesson itself, and so on. But the value of that, how can you measure $1,200 uh, when it means so much for the rest of your career? It's it, it really nothing in comparison. I've earned that money back many times since then. Mm -hmm. But without that lesson, I wouldn't have had that information, and I wouldn't have been as successful a musician. So it's really a huge and important investment. And, and I think you, you uh, also, but you would also um, remember our discussing earlier, uh, you would encourage the student to not waste their money either. No. And, uh, you know, why do you need somebody I'm to... <laughs> very happy to bring that up. So... I recently wrote an article about how to practice, and I'm sure every single teacher that watches this recognizes the fact that you have a student come to your office, play through the piece, and you sit there and you point out that crescendo was missing in the score, that accent wasn't audible, you're dragging at this point, you don't do that forte, you don't go down in piano, you're dragging in piano, and so on and so on. And these are all things that the students could have heard himself. Not only could he have heard them, he should have fixed them too. So it's just a waste of time and money to go to a teacher and use him as the world's most expensive metronome. Total waste of time and money. So go home, get yourself a recording machine, record yourself and figure those things out yourself. If you can't hear the crescendo that says in the score, Go ahead and do it. If you still can't hear it, well, do it again and make sure it can be heard. You might come to the point where you cannot fix a thing. Like, you, you simply cannot get that forte that it's supposed to be in the score. In that case, it might be a technical problem and you need to go to your teacher. But in 99% of the cases, you can fix it yourself. And you should do. Because when you're out of the university, who's going to fix you? You only have yourself. And I think I remember Jake talking in lessons about how uh, one of his uh, ultimate goals for his students was to was teaching them how to be their own best teacher. Yeah, really. Because you're only going to the studio one hour out of a week, if that, and then uh, what are you going to do the rest of the time? Yeah, and nowadays with these cell phones, they have recorders built into them. Mm -hmm. And I, sometimes I ask students, do you record yourself? Yeah, they say. Do you listen to the recording? No. <laughs> right. What's the point? I mean, this is such an effective way of learning yeah. to record, listen back, check and fix, and then record again. Is it been fixed? No. Well, go back, fix it again, and keep on doing it until you actually can hear those accents, those crescendos, and the continuity of the, of the rhythm so you're not dragging or pushing anywhere. Sounds great. Well, Steve, I know that uh, for me, uh, uh, listening to John Fletcher, uh, uh, his recording of the Vaughan Williams, his work with the London Symphony, and then he also had a solo record, a couple of solo records out uh, when, when we were uh, younger, right. uh, when there were still records. Um, it was very inspirational to me to hear his musicianship and uh, uh, artistry. Um, how was that for you? And uh, 
Um, again, the clarity was the guiding line for him, and uh, style-wise, he was very, very good too. And I think uh, to be very specific about one particular technical thing, it was the lip positioning that I didn't hear much about from the Chicago side, mm -hmm. uh, as probably we didn't have time to get into it, but John would always say smaller the further up you get. So if you look at a guitar string, for example, it might be like this long. Mm -hmm. If you want to play higher up, you just make it smaller. And even smaller, even smaller. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Now, you got a smiling amateur, which is totally opposite. That's like, you know, you go upwards instead, mm -hmm. and you stretch the guitar string, which is terrible waste of energy and it strains the guitar string very much and it might break and so with your lips if you go like this real wide mm -hmm. it's going to be real hard go smaller it's a lot easier mm -hmm. but it's not really intuitive to do it this way so that was something i had to learn to do to make it smaller rather than stretching so, uh, so that made it made a great impact on my playing. So higher up in the register, tinier and tinier. Also with the tongue going a little bit more up, mm -hmm. and then lower, of course, in the lower register. It was very important. And to 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 wrap this up, I think if you look at the art of brass playing, of being a sculpture on a square. If you go for one teacher, even if you go for a really good one you get a description of what this looks like from one angle. So what I did, I went to different teachers like Roger Bobo, uh, John Fletcher, Harvey Phillips and Jake and Michael Lynn and saw the sculpture from different angles. Mm -hmm. They all described it in fairly the same way but also with a different touch to it. And also from the top and only when you've go, gone all the way around and seen it from as many angles as possible, you really get an understanding of what this art is all about. So I really encourage all of those who look at this to go out and seek up different teachers, chew on the information for a while, and make this your own three-dimensional picture of what brass playing is about, not a two-dimensional textbook picture. I think it's a great, I think that's a, a, a really great point uh, just to get as, as many uh, really high quality points of view, very um, uh, distinguished and well described uh, observations to take back to your own artistry. Yeah. I think it's really great advice and certainly it's uh, worked out well for you very nicely. We're all very different but uh, having a, a broad picture and trying to make it your own Make the, inf make the information your own. Yeah. That is really uh, going to help anyone. I think that's true. W w one experience that uh, Oystein uh, got to have uh, yesterday for the first time was to go to an American football game. Yeah. How did you enjoy that? Ducks beat <laughs> UCLA? It was a life-changing experience. <laughs> no, really, it was very, very much fun. And we got a good couple of good seats at the 50-yard line, which for those of you who haven't been to an American football game, it's in the middle of the field. And um, you can see everything going back and forth. They're fighting uh, to get that ball yard by yard up uh, on the field. Um, we ha heard a great uh, band. Oregon Marching Band. Oregon Marching Band. And not only that, I got to play sousaphone with them, which was a fantastic experience. Now, I was given a book with the melodies in it. First of all, I didn't know the book. Secondly, I didn't, don't know the fingerings for the B-flat, so that didn't, didn't, didn't do me much good. But And also, when the conductor goes, three, four, boom, like, you don't have time to find the right page. So I was really forced to just go listening there. And uh, if you saw a guy moving the sousaphone in all the wrong directions, it would, be, would have been me. But it was a very, very good time being on that football game, seeing that. And it's one of the best in the country, I hear. Yeah, it is. It's one of the, one of the top. Yeah. And Puddles was there yesterday, <laughs> doing a lot of push-ups. That is right. Uh, Puddles wanted me to uh, um, give you thanks uh, for taking the time to... Uh, Sit with us and talk about Jake and other uh, other uh, issues and and uh, memories. It was great. It's great having you here. Uh, being as self-absorbed as he is, he wanted to give you a, a uh, cap that has his image on it. Of course, that's just the way he is. But uh, uh, we give you this um, University of Oregon um, football baseball cap with our thanks. And it's been a pleasure Thank having you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Bravo.
Yeah. Bravo. And now back to you.